Hello again and welcome to part 4 of lecture 1 of ENGR 2301 Engineering Statics. In this uh, the fourth and final part of the lecture, we are going to cover the concept of engineering models. And this is something that I uh, do like to talk about because I think it's foundational to not only this class, but uh, many courses that you will work through uh, as you go through your education. Uh, many courses, not just in uh, engineering, but the, many of the things that we're going to talk about are applicable to even uh, physics and chemistry and many other uh, areas of design and uh, etc. Any STEM field uses this kind of thing quite a bit. Okay, so, but I'm going to talk about it in sp uh, in particular with the uh, uh, I'm going to talk about models in particular as applied to engineering. So an engineering model. Now, if I talk to, uh, to the average person on the street and ask them what a model is. Uh, well, if they're not thinking about uh, someone walking down a runway, uh, modeling clothes or something like that, which is definitely not what we're talking about here, uh, they're probably going to say, think, some, think of something like, oh, like a model train set or a model airplane. A, a, that is a scale model, and that's really not what, I, what I'm talking. That's really not what I'm getting at when I'm talking about an engineering model. So we're not talking about. Um, a scale model can be thought of as a type of engineering model, but I'm talking more conceptually than a uh, than a physical scale model of something. So often in engineering, we do actually create scale models of things. For example, if you are investigating a, uh, if you're an aerospace engineer, uh, you might uh, construct a small uh, model airplane and put it in a wind tunnel and see how it reacts to uh, forces and what kind of lift it generates at various velocities, or if you are a, a structural engineer and you're designing a tall building, uh, in fact, any tall building, like uh, any uh, building over a certain height, you actually are required by code to do wind tunnel modeling of it. So you can uh, go and, uh, for example, the current uh, world record for the tallest building, I believe, is still the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. And if you go search online, you can find some really great uh, information on how the wind, uh, wind tunnel tested that. You can pretty much Google any, uh, you know, world's highest building or go to Wikipedia and look at the uh, list of world's tallest buildings and structures and just put in that phrase and put the name of that structure in and then wind tunnel testing. You'll find all sorts of cool videos and stuff out there uh, from over the years. But so uh, that's a scale model that's neat, that's definitely useful and cool and everything else, but that's really not what I, what I, want, what I want to get at today. I'm talking about something more uh, broad, something more philosophical almost, something more uh, conceptual. So an engineering model is a way of, uh, instead, we're talking about a conceptual framework. An engineering model is a conceptual framework and really what this is is a way of simplifying the complex world into something that can be analyzed. Uh, simplifying the infinite complexity of the world and the universe uh, of the world into something we can actually work with. Uh, into something we can actually uh, use, analyze, work with design, etc. Uh, use, design, etc. And to illustrate this, to illustrate the concept of, a, uh, of an engineering model, or at least a physics model or a scientific model, I am going to go into, uh, I'm going to get, uh, illustrate one of my favorite examples of how deep down the rabbit hole you can go uh, if you don't make simplifications. Let's say you decide, tomorrow you decide that, or I decide, uh, I decide I want to model something very simple. A uh, ball thrown through the air. A ball thrown through the air. So, you probably, well, I guess I shouldn't say probably, you've all taken physics at this point. And something you always learn in elementary physics 
is projectile motion. Uh, it's taught because it's one of the f one of the easiest ways to get students familiar with working with equations, uh, modeling basic systems in terms of those equations, learning how to describe physical things in terms of mathematical relationships. And that's one of the reasons we always teach students uh, projectile motion when they're learning elementary physics class. So I, I throw a ball, oh, through the air, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it lands at a certain point here. So, uh, and that's all well and good, but uh, what kind of assumptions is this making? Well, um, it makes a few assumptions, many assumptions actually. And let's see what kind of assumptions this kind of projectile motion is assuming. So. Um, basically, we are assuming, we assume acceleration is constant, at least in traditional classical projectile motion, elementary projectile motion. A is constant, or basically equal to G, uh, negative 9.8 meters per second, or negative 32, or not meters per second, meters per second squared, or uh, negative 32.2 feet per second squared if you're using the uh, English system. So, and again, if, you're, if you don't recall, or if it's been a while, these, this is the type of thing where you'll have, oh, you know, uh, these are the type of things where you'll have equations like delta x equals one half a t squared plus v initial t plus, uh, well, I guess that the delta already takes that into account. Uh, we don't need the x naught, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are very basic equations. Uh, you've seen these all before. These are very similar, very simple plug and chug type physics equations. And the reason that they're great is that uh, you don't have to, you can teach, ba the reason we like these in physics is that you can teach uh, basic principles of physics to someone without having to them to know calculus yet. So very good for high school level physics and things like that. Okay, so one of the core assumptions is that uh, acceleration is equal to g or is equal to 32.2. Okay, so that's well and good. What else do we assume? We also assume air resistance is negligible. Now, if I'm modeling, or if I want to predict where a, if I have a, you know, a simple device, or if I'm just throwing, a, if I could accurately throw a ball the same velocity again and again, uh, or if I had a pitching machine, for example, a baseball pitching machine, and I aimed at a certain angle, uh, that would actually be pretty decent. These two assumptions, assuming that G is a uh, fixed value and assuming that air resistance is negligible, or assuming that the only acceleration the object is, uh, experiences is gravity and that that's a constant value, uh, this would actually be, for, mo for many kind of common everyday situations, uh, pr normal projectiles like throwing a ball, you know, throwing something in a room, across a room, normal situations like that, typical situations, this will be reasonably accurate. You can predict where an object will land with a couple percent uh, certainty. And but of course, it really depends on what you're trying to do, though. Uh, but what if we start making the situation a little more complex? For example, uh, what if I am launching something through the air that has a very large surface area relative to its volume or relative to its mass? So if you're throwing like a baseball or a stone or something like that or a flying soccer ball, um, those are not as affected by wind as some other things, but what if I'm throwing a paper airplane or a wad of paper? Well, those are going to be uh, very susceptible to wind. Um, so that's going to, so that's really going to, uh, that's really going to um, really put a, uh, a, really put the lie to my assumption that air resistance is negligible. Or what happens if uh, we are launching things in more extreme conditions? So, for example, what if you are, uh, okay, well, I, when I think of long distance projectiles, I always end up with something, you know, I always end up with some military example or something like that, like a artillery shell or a sniper or something like that. Well, uh, you know, have, how snipers operate, no, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in such things, but I, I, at least I know that if you're trying to hit a small target at a very long distance away, you need to take into account all sorts of little things like the... Uh, wind between you and the target, the even, even for long range things like artillery, even the curvature of the earth, uh, etc. So let's say for whatever reason that we were not content with our, let's say I wanted, I, I was in a, a building, let's say I'm standing in a building and I want to model with ever increasing accuracy where this uh, object that I'm throwing is going to land. How can I increase its my accuracy more and more? 
Well, um, let's see, what can I do? Uh, first of all, I could start worrying about uh, air. I could start worrying about air and start worrying about air resistance. Now, if this is in an enclosed room, uh, I would not have to worry about that too much. There wouldn't be large wind, uh, large amounts of wind and things like that. But if I really wanted to be accurate, I would have to say that if it's an air, con if it's an enclosed building, there will be uh, there will be air currents from like the HVAC system or something like that. So let's say I want to let's say I what do I do to try to make the I'm going to list a, I'm going to produce a list of things that will of uh, basically ever increasing absurdity um, that I could start considering if I wanted to model this more and more and more and more accurately. So consider this. Uh, one, I could talk about the uh, or how could I improve beyond how to improve uh, accuracy. beyond projectile motion. Well, let's see, what could I do? Um, again, I could model the, the air currents, or I should say calculate air currents. So I could go up with a wind gauge and at different points in the room uh, model what the, or measure what the uh, vector is of the wind at various points in this room. And this would be a three-dimensional problem, so we're already getting into computational fluid mechanics to do this properly. So this is going to be, oh, all, oh, so much fun. Uh, we're already, we're, even after our first assumption, we're at the point where we're going to need a computer to do this. Uh, two, if I, this probably won't have an eff a significant effect, but gravity is not uniform. So I could deal with non-uniform gravity. So I could you take very detailed measurements with very precise instruments, and it's varying from two things. One, uh, from local variations. Anytime that rock or that object or that ball that I'm throwing across the room Anytime it gets closer to a wall, it starts experiencing a slight gravitational force towards that. Everything in the universe attracts every other thing, including common objects like walls and floors and people and uh, furniture and everything else. That's, again, a very trivial thing. But if I wanted to just, if I, if I just take it as my mission to increase my accuracy deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually I'm going to have to start worrying about local variations in gravity due to furniture and things like that in the room. That would be quite absurd. But if I was really chasing this rabbit hole down, chasing this down the rabbit hole, I would have to start considering that. Also, the uh, gravitational gradient. This would probably be uh, more substantial. Well, that'd be an interesting calculation to see which would be larger. But uh, if nothing else, even if we were on a perfectly flat, uh, if, if we were, even if we were in open terrain or something like that, no room at all, gravity at my feet is stronger than gravity at my head. I know this. Gravity at my feet is stronger than gravity at my head. So, and that's just because uh, at, gravity gets uh, weaker as you get further away from a gravitational source like a planet. And so, uh, now, it doesn't get very substantially uh, different, even if I were to go, you know, if, if I were to compare sea level to, say, a city at an elevation of a mile high. We're here in Houston, and uh, that's a little above sea level, maybe 50 feet above sea level or so, but if I were to travel to Denver, a city that's about a mile above sea level, if... Uh, I were to measure the difference in gravity, even then it would be less than 1%. But if I was really, really, really nitpicking and really getting at the, uh, if I just said, I don't want to make any assumptions whatsoever, I'm not going to try to make any assumptions at all, I do not believe in making assumptions, I want to make the perfect calculation, let's see what it would take to actually do that, um, we'd have to consider the gravitational gradient. So again, this is basically saying, what would it take to make, to model something as simple as throwing a ball without making any assumptions whatsoever. Okay, what else can we do? Uh, variations in throwing force. Now, I cannot throw a ball with any degree of exact uh, force. Well, I, I, mean, I can't, I suppose I can. I can. I can throw a ball and hit something across a room, so I guess I shouldn't say that's no degree of uh, certainty, but if you told me to throw a ball at 28.2 miles per hour, or even, I'd probably hit some, I'd probably throw that somewhere between 26 and 29, or 25 and 30, I haven't actually 
measured the velocity of my pitches or whatever it might be, um, or the vari variance of my pitches, and we could probably find uh, different people with more uh, control over their pitching. If I want to, now, maybe there is somebody better than this, but if, uh, but my first guess, if I want to find uh, somebody who can throw a ball with the great, the least amount of variance possible, maybe I'd go and get a major league baseball pitcher and. You know, they're probably pretty good at throwing a baseball at, you know, really honed in at just the right velocity. Maybe. Or maybe they just throw it, uh, maybe they just uh, have, think more about in terms of uh, what is the most uh, best for a particular scenario. But uh, again, I'm not a baseball pitcher. But at first guess, uh, maybe I can bring a major league baseball pitcher in here and try to predict where they throw the ball rather than why I throw it. Or I could uh, avoid the person, the, the the human factor entirely, and I could replace, instead of having uh, me throw the ball, I could have a baseball pitching machine. Uh, it could be one from uh, Major League Baseball, or I could have a specially high precision instrument crafted that can, uh, maybe you can't throw a baseball very fast, but it can do it with a high degree of precision. But even then, as you've learned in science class, there are always going to be some error bars. There will always be a, maybe if I'm modeling that, saying the velocity that it goes out at is, I don't know, 30 miles per hour, but there's always going to be plus or minus some variance, some delta B, some variance, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we can minimize this, but we can never eliminate it. Uh, there will always be some variation. Okay, so what else we got? We can just, we, we might be here all day. Uh, what else could we do? Well, I could, I could, if I really wanted to get pedantic, I could start talking about the, uh, well, drag for one, not air currents, but drag. That's actually not pedantic at all. I should, probably should have put this one first. Uh, drag is not air currents being blown by the air. That's just the resistive force that the ball experiences as it moves through the air. It's going to be, um, now often we model drag as being uh, proportional to uh, you know, CD times uh, rho CD uh, V squared. Rho CD V squared. We often model that uh, as approximately like that. And the thing about this, though, is that uh, rho, again, that's an assumption because you're assuming that constant density throughout the room. Uh, coefficient of drag, that's a kludge factor. It's not perfect. It's uh, uh, the local variations in geometry will be a big thing. And velocity, we don't know the exact velocity at any time anyway. So even if we wanted to include drag, we would have to make, we would have to get into the nitty gritty. If I wanted to say no assumptions whatsoever in my calculation, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole down to infinity. We'd have more assumptions to break down in the drag equation. So we'd have to model, oh, as the air currents blow around the room, uh, the density of the air modifies slightly. Oh, even more fun, as the ball flies through the air, there's a slight increase of density. There's a wave of increasing density, like the bow, uh, like the wake of a ship, and that's going to slightly insignificantly affect the drag. But again, if we wanted to just have no assumptions in our calculation at all, we'd have to. We, I want to know where that lands to within a, you know, a picometer. Uh, we're going to have to start worrying about that. What else can we do? Oh man, we're just gonna, we'll be here all day. How about the uh, compression of the ball? Uh, compression of the ball. So as a ball flies through the air, it's going to be striking, um, it's going to be striking air molecules. Now, truth be told, what that does is that causes the ball to deform slightly. So let me draw this really, uh, so it's, it's hitting air molecules and equal and opposite forces. If it's pushing air out of the way, it ends up being elastically compressed into a smaller shape. And that would, uh, to, that might cause it to tumble a little bit. So if it's not perfectly circular, it's going to have the, the capability to tumble and that could affect its uh, motion, just like a tumbling football through the air will behave uh, differently than a uh, football thrown uh, with a spin on it. Uh, so that's going to affect its motion ever so slightly. So you're, you're talking about, you know, less than a fraction of 1% change in diameter from the air resistance that it's going through. But it's not zero. And if we want to actually have to worry about every single little thing without making any assumptions, we might have to worry about that. Oh boy, what else can we do? Um, whew, uh, how about the ball itself? Uh, 
uh, we talked about the ball. Uh, what about its? Uh, what about non-uniformity in the ball even before compression? So non-uniform ball. We uh, we might treat it as a perfect sphere when calculating a drag or a a compressed perfect sphere when using this kind of thing. But there are always going to be some variations in manufacturers. So maybe I would have a tennis ball and I would you know use some sort of highly precise laser measuring device to measure create a 3d model of the ball and every single one of those little tiny tennis ball hairs that are all over its surface and i'm modeling this thing to a ridiculous degree and just doing all of this kind of crazy and stuff uh how about thermal effects thermal effects well, as the ball flies through the air, it's gonna, it's, it is gonna experience some small amount of drag force. That's gonna call, cause the ball to heat up. That'll cause the air around it to heat up. That will affect uh, the air. Uh, the viscosity of air is highly dependent on its temperature, and like any gas. And so uh, now, of course, we're not substantially changing the temperature of the air. But again, if we want to make the, uh, if we want to consider exactly, if I want infinite precision, if I just need to know everything about this. Then I'm gonna to need to worry about the I'm gonna to need to worry about the effects of throwing the ball, the thermal effects on the air and the ball itself uh, as I throw it. Oh, and if you want to go, and all of these are probably looping back into each other because if I throw that ball, guess what I've done? As I throw the ball or the machine throws the ball, that itself is going to generate air currents. And that's going to affect how the ball is is thrown, uh, moves, and how that ball's motion is affected will then affect the air currents even more. Oh boy! Oh, and if I really want to talk about it, I could say if I had a perfectly efficient, uh, infinitely responsive air conditioning system in the building, it would be able to detect that the um, that the uh, energy dissipated by the throw, uh, or I could even not a non-perfect one. Some of that energy would, on average, cause the air conditioner to stay on slightly longer to maintain the same temperature. So the air conditioner, we have to start modeling the air conditioning system. Oh boy, Let's, so the air conditioning system, in, in its inefficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. And this is before we get into the be-all, end-all, which is really weird things like quantum effects, which are, uh, we, we could, uh, I don't know at what point you'd have to start worrying about the uncertainty principle. Uh, applying to a big macroscopic system like this, but when you start modeling, if I'm wanting to know where something lands to, by the picometer, I'm probably going to need to ha start worrying about that. Uh, and I could lump into this like uh, maybe things like uh, minute instantaneous chemical bonding. Uh, think about things like chemical bonding. Chemical bonding? What does that mean here? Why? This isn't chemistry class. Well, think about this. Chemical bonding. Remember van der Waals forces in chemistry class? Uh, those are your instantaneous bonds that you get uh, between uh, molecules, very weak ones. Well, as this ball flies through the air, it's going to interact with some, uh, on its surface, it's going to interact with some molecules in the air. And whenever you have matter in contact with matter, you're going to have van der Waals forces. So now you probably wouldn't try to model that uh, on, in, on the individual molecular level, but if you really wanted uh, arbitrary large precision, you're going to need to start creating a, mo a molecule by molecule model of this um, ball and every mo uh, molecule in the room. Oh my goodness, that's going to be insane pretty quickly. So basically, what it comes down to as our as our approach or as our desired level of precision gets higher and higher, we inevitably end up converging on almost a molecule by molecule modeling of the entire room, the entire building, and uh, maybe even the entire planet. Uh, and this is before we deal with things like uh, things outside the planet. What about if I wanted to know uh, this is being affected by gravity? But what about and we talked about the gravity of the walls? What about the gravity of uh, the moon? the sun distant planets and stars how does the gravity of jupiter affect uh the way this ball flies um well i can tell you right now that it affects it very very little but again if i was chasing arbitrarily high precision i would need to start taking into account ridiculous things like the uh motion of you know jupiter and its moons and the motion of the sun and where it is in the sky and uh, and if I really wanted, you know, 10 to negative 20th precision or something like that, uh, there'd be a certain level of really insane precision 
that would be absolutely impossible even without quantum effects because you would have to worry about uh, the effects of astronomical bodies that we don't even know exist yet. So for example, there might be a planet around a star 100 light years away that we haven't discovered yet. And if you were, and, and it does through a very real sense, um, because gravity has no range limit, as that undiscovered planet orbits around a star, a hundred, some unnamed star, a hundred light years away, uh, this does nothing but that we don't. It just sits anonymously in some astronomer's star catalog, um, and for and the planet we don't even know exists yet, um, or maybe the moon, the undiscovered moon, or the undiscovered planet on the star that doesn't even have a name. Um, <laughs> If you wanted to model the motion, now it'd be an interesting calculation to see where that becomes important. What, like, what level of precision is it? Nanometers? Is it picometers? Is it femtometers? What is it? But uh, beyond a certain point, you have to start worrying about things that you don't know about and can't even know about, and etc. So, um, at the end of the day, you end up uh, basically what it comes down to is past a certain level of precision. Uh, level of precision. There is only one way to calculate where the ball will land. Really, only one way. Uh, to find where the ball will land. And that's to simulate and calculate everything. As you keep chasing accuracy higher and higher and higher, what you would really, uh, uh, what you would end up doing is quite absurd. Uh, so first, you would, you know, calculate, start looking at macroscopic objects. You'd look at the Earth and the air and drag and the ball, but uh, eventually you start worrying about far distant astronomical bodies because you're chasing tiny little minutia. Or where you're ending up at, where this converges to, is a you're trying to create a gigantic computer simulation a molecule by molecule, you're trying to model, um, you basically have to, to, uh, to predict where a ball lands with infinite precision, you would basically have to model everything. I mean, literally everything, the entire universe. You would have to model every single um, molecule, every single atom, where its current position is, which we'll definitely run into the quantum uncertainty principle. Um, but, uh, and even deeper, you'd have to start worrying about things like subatomic particles and quarks and the things that, uh, you know, quarks are things that your protons and neutrons are made of. So you had have to basically know everything. You would have to know everything about everything, literally everything about everything, uh, and have an infinitely powerful computer in order to um, predict with arbitrarily high precision where a ball lands. So, and the only way to do that, uh, you would need a computer that is bigger than the universe because you really can't simulate, you cannot perfectly simulate something with infinite precision um, or with perfect precision with a device that is less complex than the, uh, than the system that you're modeling. So we can model to a high degree of accuracy, say, uh, to the limits of our theories, say like the... I don't know, the motions of uh, the nuclei or the subatomic particles in a neutron or in a, uh, the motions of neutrons in a, a, a nucleus or something. But there you're just looking at a small sphere of matter, just a couple neutrons or something like that. Um, and even those make some assumptions. Uh, so, but uh, again, if you're trying to model huge macroscopic objects, you know, even even if you're trying to mod model a gram of material, a single gram of material uh, at the subatomic level, forget about it. It's, you would need a computer more powerful than anything we will probably ever be able to create, and it may even be, may, may even be theoretically possible, etc. So anyway, we definitely went down the rabbit hole here. I know this took a while, but the point of this, I love this example because it starts with something so childishly simple, something so basic, just the motion of a ball through the air. And as we chase ever higher levels of precision, we basically end up trying to create a molecule by model, molecule computer model of literally the entire universe. Because if I want to know where that thing it lands to the 10 to the negative 100th meters of accuracy, that's basically what I'm going to have to do. So thankfully, though, we are engineers. And uh, I should say that I, I might be tempted to say, oh, flip, the, I'll leave that to the physicists. I'll let them chase infinite precision. But... Even physicists don't do that. They make uh, the very similar types of pro they work through a very similar process, where they find assumptions that they can make. 
So, uh, what can save us from this nonsense and this black hole of, or this rabbit hole of uh, uh, chaos? And that's the idea of the engineering model, or the scientific, or a scientific model. But this is engineering class. We'll be talk. We'll be describing these as engineering models. So there are a few key things that engineering models have. One, uh, they have certain assumptions. They make certain assumptions. Or they're built on certain assumptions. These assumptions can be completely impossible. They can actually be completely impossible, um, but that's okay. Um, so for example, the ball flying through the air, you might assume it doesn't deform at, at all. That's impossible. Uh, you might assume that the gravity is constant uh, throughout the room. That is completely impossible. There is no way in this universe to create a room-sized um, volume that has literally constant gravity that is physically impossible. But you know what? That's okay. We're not tracing it. We're not going down the rabbit hole of infinite precision. I don't really care about where the ball lands to 10 to the negative 30th meters or whatever crazy number we could pick up, we could uh, find. Uh, every, we, we can make assumptions, even if those are impossible, if they're appropriate to whatever given system we're looking at. So it would not be a, now they have to, those assumptions uh, can be impossible, but they must be appropriate. So it can be impossible or physically impossible. Uh, physically impossible in the technically uh, impossible phase, uh, a phrase I should probably say. Like you're not, you know, we're not going to make an assumption in a physics or in a thermodynamics class that I assume free energy or I assume perpetual motion or I assume, you know, something like that that just completely is completely batty, has no relation to reality whatsoever. It's more like we'll assume things like, um, for example, again, back here, we assume gravity is constant throughout the room. Uh, is that actually physically possible? No, but it's a reasonable approximation of uh, reality. Um, but uh, must be appropriate and reasonable. Appropriate, reasonable, and approximately correct. And approximately correct. So one, they make certain assumptions. Two, by doing so, they simplify a complex system. Oh, I, one final note on the assumptions, uh, appropriate assumptions. An example of an inappropriate assumption uh, modeling this type of problem, uh, an inappropriate assumption, a good one for that would be like, I assume constant velocity. So if I assume constant velocity, that would be I throw the ball in the air and it just keeps on going forever upwards, especially if the room is very large. Now, if the room is very small or I'm, I'm throwing the ball at a target very close by, that actually may not be a, a inappropriate assumption. If you're firing a uh, arrow at a something very close by or throwing something really close or something at a very high velocity uh, like a rifle bullet uh, at a nearby target that's not a bad assumption but for this type of problem if I'm throwing a, a ball relatively slowly it is uh, constant velocity is an improper and Im inappropriate and a insufficiently accurate assumption so um, again by doing so they simplify a complex system and that allows us to analyze and design things. And three, uh, and so by doing so, they simplify a complex system. And uh, in turn, and or finally, I should say the final thing with engineering models is that they um, they have certain applicability. Limited applicability. No engineering model is universally applicable. So for example, 
back to this year, well, um, the projectile motion assumption, as we discussed at the beginning of the, of the lecture, of this part of the lecture, um, the projectile motion assumption asks that the, uh, assumes that the gravity is constant and that drag is um, zero. And it also, assume, now it's usually not stated all this other nonsense here, but uh, it actually is assuming all of these things as well are negligible. But uh, as we discussed, if we start dealing with very extreme forms of projectile motion, like uh, a you know a, a artillery shell launched 50 miles away, well then you're gonna have to start dealing with things like a drag. You're definitely gonna need drag, probably air, uh, wind, um, curvature of the earth, uh, all sorts of things like that. But even then, you're not gonna still start you know uh, dealing with the infinite uh, precision problem there. Even that type of thing, you will have some assumptions, but you just need to eliminate some of your assumptions. And, but you'll still make some, you'll make different ones, or uh, I would say many of the same assumptions, uh, but less than you do with your basic projectile motion uh, model. So they have certain applicability. And that's the basic idea of an engineering model. So they have certain applicability and you as an engineer you have a duty to know what, is, what, the, what the assumptions behind the equations and methods you are using. You must uh, know the equation, the, assum the uh, methods, uh, or the assumptions, I should say the applicability of the model that you are using. If you, for example, are a uh, civil engineer designing a, um, a water distribution system, you can make the reasonable assumption that the density of water is constant. For uh, now, some places might, consider, might take that into account, but uh, at, basic, at a basic level, basic water distribution systems, especially things like open channel flow and canals and things like that, uh, you can get by often assuming that uh, the, the density of water is constant. Even though that's not really true, its density does vary with pressure, air pressure and temperature, or atmospheric pressure and temperature, but in the types, especially pipes that are in the ground and stuff, uh, the temperature really doesn't vary that much through the year, and so, um, and the pressure doesn't really change, so, uh, or at least very much, so you can usually get away with assuming, uh, when designing your system, I will assume that water has a density of X, uh, approximately 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or 62.4 pounds per cubic foot if you're using English units, but uh, that's a reasonable assumption for, mo for civil, most civil engineers designing water distribution systems. However, if you are a nuclear engineer, uh, or a mechanical engineer in the say the design of a uh, heat exchanger in a nuclear power plant, you cannot make that assumption. You're dealing with wide ranges of temperatures and pressures. Uh, you're dealing with things at much higher with much higher consequence of failures. So, if you screw up the water distribution up uh, uh, pipe, you know, in a suburban neighborhood, uh, if you screw up that design, uh, that's going to be very costly. I mean, you're gonna you could be looking at tens of thousands of dollars of replacing a decent sized pipe if the if, you, if it fails wrong. But odds are you're not going to kill somebody unless they just happen to be right over top of it when the pipe bursts. Uh, even then, probably not. Uh, but a nuclear power plant, if that thing, uh, if something goes really wrong there, well, I don't need to, I just need to say words like uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl. And uh, well, those aren't really because of engineering failures. That wouldn't be fair to the engineers that designed those. But uh, the consequences of failure in, uh, in uh, nuclear engineering are going to be a lot higher than, um, you know, designing basic residential pipe networks and things like that. So, uh, uh, or, and also uh, the conditions are more extreme. And so the variation in water density will be much more substantial. At least as far as I'm aware. Now maybe there are a uh, maybe a nuclear uh, engineer could correct me and say, "Oh, we well, just assume constant density anyway, and use a big factor of safety." I haven't designed the thermal systems nuclear plants myself. I'm spitballing, but um, anyway. So again, but the key is, as an engineer, you need to be aware of what assumptions are baked into whatever equations and models you're using. So with that, I'd like to talk about the two most important uh, models uh, for engineering statics class. And these are both completely impossible, but that's okay.
Uh, the two most important models are the rigid body assumption and the point particle assumption. Uh, models for statics class. Now we already said that uh, we're assuming that we have constant uh, velocity or zero acceleration, uh, but that's okay. I'm not talking, that's just more of an assumption. I'm talking about some generic models that we use or some specific models that we use in this class. The first one is the point particle assumption. And basically we will, in this class, we will, uh, we will treat objects as either a point particle or a rigid body. So one, uh, a point particle model. A point particle is an idealized object. So a, a point particle uh, model basically assumes that all of the mass of an object exists at one point. Exists at a point. Uh, its center of mass. The center of mass and sometimes and often it doesn't it, you use this assumption without even realizing you're using it so for example remember the uh guy standing on the surface of the earth notice i didn't talk about uh where his center of mass was i didn't talk about uh the fact that oh there's two feet on the ground they have this much area and that kind of thing no we just said oh there's a for there's a normal force upward and a weight downward you are basically assuming that that person is just a single point mass um, with weight pulling down and normal force pushing upward. Uh, weight and normal force equal and opposite, etc. You're treating this system as if it can be modeled as a point particle. Anything under certain circumstances can be modeled as a point particle, but some cases, it's in some circumstances, it can't be, just depending on what kind of thing you're dealing with. And what's special about this is, um, Think about this. Think about a object with size. Here, let's say it has a center of mass here, like so. I apply a force to this. It's gonna, it's going to experience two things. One, a tendency to translate, which is the tendency to move left, right, up, or down, forward and backward. But it will also experience a tendency to rotate. And so uh, an object that has dimensions will have a tendency to both translate and or, uh, that will have, will have a tendency to both translate and rotate. But what about a point particle? What if I apply a force to it? What's going to happen? Well, uh, if you remember back to your uh, physics class, in order to get rotation, you need two things. You need a force and a moment arm. If this force is going right through that center of mass, uh, there is no moment or nor torque generated, so this thing cannot rotate. So point particles cannot experience rotation. And therefore, you don't need to consider, uh, you don't consider rotational forces like uh, torques and moments. Remember how we said a lot of statics is going to come back down to balancing forces, sum of forces equal to zero? Well, in point particles, you don't have to worry about rotational forces or moment, which we call moments. Uh, so we don't consider rotational forces, which we designate, which we call, refer to as moments. But we'll get to that later in the semester. So, uh, or in terms of balance of forces, we can just say that the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to the summation of forces in the y direction. And we'll get to this more when we get to equilibrium, but I'm just giving you a sneak peek. Summation of forces in the z direction, all of these must be equal to zero. Summation of forces x, summation of forces y, summation of forces z, all of these are translational forces. Again, you have a body. Translation means it moving left, uh, left or right, up or down, 
forward or backward into the page here. And rotation means turning uh, about the x y, rotation about the x y or z axis. But here we're not worried about uh, summation of for uh, we're not worried about uh, rotation. We're only worried about linear forces. Two. Uh, the rigid body model. Oh, and actually, I should mention this is impossible. Uh, just like many many of our assumptions we're going to make. Uh, or the things that you assume in, uh, just like many of the models used in physics and, and chemistry, etc., this is completely impossible. It is impossible for an object's mass to exist entirely at a point. Uh, we have a word for a macroscopic object where all of its mass exists at a point. We call it a black hole, and it causes problems. Um, so <laughs> that's an understatement. It causes problems. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, if you compress your mass to the uh, uh, the size of a, if you compressed all of your mass into a singularity, uh, that would actually explode with quite an impressive um, yield. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with it, you can Google something called Hawking radiation, uh, that as far as we know, black holes decay. And that would be, uh, so yeah, uh, and good to, uh, in terms of E equals MC square, if you could, uh, if you could snap your fingers and uh, turn yourself into a point mass, well, in a small fraction of a second, that would evaporate, well, a euphemism term, evaporate, uh, more likely, better, more, a better term would be explode, and that explosion would probably have a more yield than the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated. So, don't do that. Not that you could, but that would be, um, yeah, or at least go out in the, you know, some middle of the ocean somewhere before you do that, or preferably off planet. Um, but in, and it's now getting off the planet might be hard, but if you can transform yourself into a point mass, maybe you can do that too. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, back to uh, reality. Rigid body assumption, or rigid body model. The rigid body model assumes that the object does have dimensions. One, the object will have dimensions. But two, the object does not deform. The object does not deform. So this is completely and utterly impossible. If I have a beam and I put a load on it, so I have a beam on both ends. If I put a load on it, it is going to bend. I don't care how strong the beam is. I don't care how sl how uh, slight the load is. It is going to bend. If I put a uh, if I can get the the biggest strongest steel member that I possibly could, even a relatively short one, so it won't bend that much. If I I could get a you know eight foot long, uh, you know, three meter long, whatever. Um, that's not three meters, but let's just give some rough numbers. Three meters long, relatively short beam. And I get the heaviest, most monstrous steel beam you can get in the steel manual or any country's steel manual. I get the biggest, most monstrous, most mondo beam I can possibly find. And I set it up like this and I put a feather on it. It will bend. Now, of course, that's going to be an incredibly, incredibly small amount, but it's not going to be so small as, you know, it's not going to be like gravity the moon uh, small. It's not going to be, you know, subatomic uh, uh, forces, effects uh, small. And if you had a sensitive enough instrument, you could actually measure um, the deflection of a big, strong steel beam under even a feather, or you could measure that under a, you know, that's the kind of force you get from like, you know, blowing on it with your breath or something like that. But that does call, cause some small amount of deformation. So if you have a, it's kind of cool to think about this. If you have a, if you're in a building and there's a, you're walking on a floor in say a second story, as you walk across that room, as you walk across that, uh, you are causing the floor to bend and shift as you walk. Now, in certain very flexible floors uh, that are sometimes, if they're built uh, too flexible, you can actually sometimes feel that. Although usually that's because of like, uh, vi uh, you know, uh, harmonic vibration rather than raw force. But uh, in certain cases, you can't actually feel it. But uh, 
uh, yeah, but even if you're on a be uh, in a building with a gigantic, thick, really strong steel floor, or and concrete floor slab on steel beams or something like that, uh, very stiff floor system, you will still slightly bend that floor. So yes, you can tell all your friends that, um, uh, yeah, you, that there's a f engineering joke in there somewhere about uh, someone being so fat they bend uh, concrete beams or, or concrete floor slabs as, as they walk across them. But uh, the truth is, uh, anybody does that, or even a mouse does that walking across even the strongest floor, because even the smallest force does cause some small amount of deformation in any in any real material. But so basically, what we're assuming, and this is what we're assuming, is that this is not the case. We're saying the object does not deform. So, in other words, if I pull, I, so we're assuming the opposite, basically. Uh, if we are saying that if, even if P is infinitely large, if you had a, it, the, normally when you, when you compress objects, they, they shrink down a bit and also bow out a bit like this. You'll see that in mechanics and materials if you haven't already. Well, actually, if you're, far, if you're our students, you won't have seen that yet because that's uh, statics is a prerequisite for mechanics and materials. But even if P was infinitely large, in, in our assumption here, in the, in the rigid body model, even if P is infinitely large, your delta X, your change in length here, delta X is zero. It doesn't matter how large the force is, the uh, deformation is zero. And so, of course, this is impossible. Um, just like the, the idea of it not, of any non-zero deformation occurring uh, is impossible. So, but that's fine. It's one of those things, like just like the uh, baseball being truly impossible from a pure physics point of view, the projectile motion uh, assumption being impossible from a perfect precision point of view, this is still valid um, in many ranges of forces. So we assume object uh, do not bend, twist, flex, or deform in any, way, or in any manner. Uh, twist stretch, compress, or deform whatsoever. In one of the courses that following that follows statics and uh, mechanics and materials, you eliminate this assumption. Start start asking um, how do objects made of real materials, or uh, uh, how do objects actually made of uh, real materials, behave? How do if you apply a t uh, torque to a, a drive shaft, how much does it twist? If I apply a force to a beam, how much does it bend? Uh, those are questions for mechanics and materials. Uh, and really, when you break, just like when dynamics, when we assume that assumption, we, when, we, when we abandon the assumption of acceleration being zero, we have to do an entirely new course to cover that. This is the same thing here. When we abandon the rigid body model, it seems like something relatively simple, but it, the um, statics at truthfully, at, at a, not truthfully, deeply assumes this. And uh, if you want to start taking the, think, these things into account, you really need an entire course to discuss that because we're going to have enough to learn about in statics class already. So this is completely impossible, but again, it doesn't really matter. Not that, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. Uh, for many, uh, for most systems, many or most systems, Common engineering systems uh, engineering systems this assumption is reasonably valid And by reasonably, uh, again, depending where you're looking at it. And to, I could give you examples of where, uh, you know, where rigid body assumption is appropriate, where it's not. Obviously, if you're trying to calculate deflection, well, then you can't use that. But even beyond that, we're basically assuming that um, we're going to see through the course uh, based on uh, how forces are applied to an object, how does the, how do those distribute through a framework or something. And the distribution of forces will depend on, uh, will vary slightly if it was rigid versus non-rigid. 
but the difference there is usually you know one or two percent very small etc but if you had systems that were very very flexible if you had things that were made of very bendy or twisty materials well then that assumption would no longer be valid for your analysis and you'd have to use more advanced forms but i don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole so but another key thing about this is that does have dimensions so we talked about it's uh we talked about um the importance of the non-deformity or the non-deforming but what about having dimensions so because rigid bodies have dimensions here's your center of mass for example if i apply a force p this will have both a tendency to translate and to rotate so therefore uh, rigid bodies can both translate and rotate Thus, in static analysis, uh, analyses, we will need to consider both rotational and translational forces. Uh, both translational and rotational forces. And rotational forces. So what those mean are, uh, we'll have our sum of forces in the x direction equals the sum of forces in the y direction equals the sum of forces in the z direction, and all of these are equal to zero. And we will see this again when we get to equilibrium. I'm just going to give you a bit of a sneak peek. Sum of, for sum of moments about the x-axis is equal to sum of, sum of moments about the y-axis is equal to sum of moments about the z-axis, and this is all equal to zero. Each, or each of these are equal to zero. And so don't worry too much about these are down, but just compare the forces in the x or the, the, balance, the equations that we use for the point particle versus the equations we use for the rigid body. Here we have to consider both translation and rotation, we have to consider both translation and rotation. And this, uh, this actually uh, infinite def uh, stiffness material, this material that doesn't bend or twist, what, uh, et cetera, uh, that it's actually kind of humorous to think about what kind of uh, mischief you could cause if you actually did have a bunch of that material. For example, if you had a material that uh, literally had infinite stiffness, you could uh, laugh at Einstein and uh, send signals faster than light. So, for example, if you um, uh, let's talk about abusing the rigid body model, uh, and this would be an area where uh, you could where the assumption would not be appropriate. But think about this. Consider a very long pole. Uh, now, uh, things like a flagpole or, if I, or simple like a flagpole or something like that, a small handheld one or something, or a meter stick or a yardstick or something like that, we're used to treating these as rigid bodies. Um, we tend to think that, oh, if I move this end, this end instantaneously moves. And the truth is, though, that's not actually the case. If I apply a force here, and it starts, and this moves to the left, or it moves to the right. It doesn't instantaneously move to the right. It moves to the right at a certain speed. Really, what happens is a compression wave goes through the object, and this moves, and then a small fraction of a second later, this end moves. If we're applying a force p here, so we first uh, apply a force p here, and this end moves. It compresses inside a bit, and then this compression wave travels through the object. And only after some non-zero amount of time does this move. Now, that uh, if I uh, under if I remember correctly, that velocity should be the speed of sound of the material. Uh, although maybe not, I'd have to uh, review my physics. But it's definitely uh, not instantaneous. And so, uh, if you could, if you did have an, a rigid body though, um, this speed would be infinite. It could not compress. So therefore, if you uh, pushed on this end this end here would instantaneously move. So you would have something that could, uh, you have something that you can affect something here, and then instantaneously you could affect some, you could cause some chap, some uh, effect over here in zero time. And in physics, that causes all sorts of problems. In a, uh, so for example, in a, a more macroscopic example, imagine this pole were, was a light year long, for example. 
and I came here and I jostled one end of it and the other end of it moved instantaneously. Well, if I timed the motions of my jostling just right, I could basically use Morse code or something, or I could use Morse code or something to send a signal. And if there was somebody on the other end recording that, I would basically be able to transfer a signal faster than light. I could do FTL communication with this thing. And, uh, well, that causes all sorts of problems. You can read about, up about that in, in relativity or something. But if you did have faster than light communication, that causes all sorts of problems. Uh, if you had a true rigid body, I believe there are also ways you could really abuse it to say like laugh in the face of thermodynamics and create perpetual motion machines and other nonsense, which really isn't possible. So <laughs> if you really had a rigid body, a truly rigid body, an infinitely stiff, zero deformation material, you could cause all sorts of fun and uh, havoc with it. But anyway, uh, that'll do it for our discussion of engineering models. I know this went a little bit long. I hope, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I really like to talk about this particular example here just because it illustrates how um, how absurd you can get when you start uh, saying that you don't want to make any assumptions. But uh, the key thing to take away of this uh, or from this is to always be aware of what mo what models you're using, what the limitations of those models are, what the what the what kind of and also what kind of models were assumed when uh, in the derivation of whatever equations you are using. So um, one of the quickest ways to kill somebody as a practicing engineer is to use an equation outside of its range of applicability. Every single equation that you'll ever see in any engineering design code uh, has certain assumptions baked into it. And as a practicing engineer, you need to be aware of those what those assumptions are it, because otherwise you can easily end up using those equations uh, somewhere where they're not valid. And that is a quick way to kill somebody depending on what you're designing. So uh, with that cheery thought, I think I'll let, I'll, I'll let us go uh, now. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all. I uh, hope you all uh, learned a few things. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, that'll do for today. Uh, thank you for get, get, coming through uh, this video. I will see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.